Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to our viewers choice lesson tonight. And hopefully we're gonna really enjoy analyzing a couple games. And uh, you're welcome to ask your questions, analyze together. So let's start with the first game. Uh, the first game was played by Ethan with White. And he will, he's here in the audience, he will be helping me with the moves. And again, if you have any questions, just ask and let's analyze together. So Ethan, let's start with the first move. Uh, E4. E4. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before we start, can you let us know which tournament was it and what was your opponent? This was a nice quest and it was Jonathan Lee, who's 1700. So Ethan, um, he's about 1600 and he played uh, the guy who, who about 1780. So, and did you win the game? Uh, yeah. So Ethan played with White and he won the game against a stronger opponent. So let's see how it all went. Uh, C5, Okay, so we see Sicilian. E6. Paulson. E4. Okay. Uh, takes, takes. Takes, takes. A6. A6, okay, let's stop here. So um, your opponent played A6 and basically uh, he kind of identified the structure. So he plays Paulson variation of Sicilian. And then besides a6, he could have played knight c6. That's another line. And here, there is a big choice in front of white. So do you guys know what, is, what are the most popular moves here? What would you suggest as, as white? Knight c3. Knight, uh, knight c3, right? Yeah. That's probably the most popular move and c4 right so knight c3 and c4 another another move that is very popular any suggestions ethan bishop d3, bishop d3 right so basically here we're talking about bishop d3 knight c3 and c4 three moves how did you continue bishop d3, bishop d3. Uh, knight f6 knight f6 um oh, okay well, Sicilian is a complicated opening. You have to know so many lines in the Sicilian. So it's very hard work. It's not that you just study three lines and you're good to go. You know that world champions play Sicilian. It's one of the most popular openings. I played Sicilian all my life, and that's one of my favorite openings. And actually, I play Paulson myself uh, as black. So uh, in this position, well, besides knight of six, first of all, there are other moves like bishop c5 is possible here. Then you can play, well, knight of six, obviously. But uh, I would say bishop c5 has been one of the most popular moves. And then say knight b3. And then here, probably you know, bishop to e7 or bishop to a7, two moves here possible. And you know, the theory doesn't stop developing and People play different moves, um, even including like 97, 96. So it's just really the matter of choice. But the main moves that you should know is bishop c5 after knight b3, you retreat to e7 and then a7. And then the other move, like what Ethan played, knight of 6 uh, I'm sorry, your opponent played, not, not you, you played with white. So here you continued with a3. Okay, so what was the thread that you decided to continue well, with a3? I play. So you played a3, how did your opponent respond? Uh, bishop c5, knight b3. Knight b3. So really, a3, you don't need that move. Yeah. So going forward, you can just respond with either c4, or knight c3, or just castle. Probably the easiest. If you didn't like bishop b4, just castle over here. And then really there is no sense to play bishop before yeah. because after you castle your king, he cannot really pin you. Okay, bishop c5, he continued. Three bishop a7. So he's really doing everything right. He's not doing anything extraordinary, not playing b5 too early or d5 too early, just develops his pieces. Nice three. Uh, Queen C7. Queen C7. So 
really with the bishop on a7 you see that a3 was the loss of tempo right because nobody really threatens the b4 and it's just the loss of tempo okay how did you continue why did you decide um to play bishop g5 first did you castle short side why did you choose bishop g5 well, over castle? castle? Castle on side. Okay, that explains that. So you wanted to castle on side, yeah. okay? Rook g8. Excuse me? Rook g8. Rook g8. That's how he played. Interesting. Okay, so let me try to think it's black. Why would I want to play rook g8? So probably counting that my opponent would take on f6, then I would take, and then I would open the g file, right? What do you guys think? Why would one play rook g8 uh, well that's the only idea i can find how to explain rook g8 so what do what do you think what do you think instead of rook g8 how can black continue here what what should he do because rook g8 is really not the best move let's put it this way Move the knight, where would you move the knight? Uh, here. Not that easy to move the knight. Because, for instance, h5 is controlled by the queen, like d5 you can't move. Only like g8, which is pretty bad. So that doesn't work. I like Just knight c6, Just Just continue, continue development. If I take, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's another, you're right, Ethan, that's one of the common positions in the Sicilian as black, that black would allow this double pawns on the F file, and then after that, just most likely the king stays in the center, and you play d6, bishop d7. Um, so let's go back to this position. Was there any better move that just before bishop g5 happened, mm -hmm. kind of? Maybe just simply d6, right? Yeah. That was yeah. another move, like here. Just play d6, and then if I play bishop g5, knight d7, and then you're free to develop your queen, and you don't have to worry about not being able to castle, right? So after queen c7, well, bishop g5 is kind of, you want to play bishop g5 to attack this, this knight. And of course, after rook g8, you're very happy to see that move, right? Weren't you? Yeah. Right, so basically after you played a3 and realized that it's a loss of tempo, and then your opponent plays rook g8, you're kind of thinking, wow, a3 wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> so that compensated. Um, did you take on f6? No. Good, because basically if you take on f6, um, again, you justified it rook g8, which is really, a little bit off here. I ended up playing a, a little bit later, but well, that was for a different reason. Okay, we'll see. Uh, queen e2. Queen e2. Uh, we have a choice between queen e2 and queen d2 I here, right? Knight g4. Knight g4, agree. Okay. Uh, so if queen d2, knight g4, and then let's show it to everybody. And then you have to think how to defend the pawn. You can probably retreat here right and then protect the pawn on f2 but still you're giving that option to the knight to be yeah, on e5 to be in the center and then not necessarily you really like that so yeah, queen e2 have, perfect castle, yeah just great move queen e2 okay castle, long side castle how did he continue knight b7 okay let's stop here for a second so you know, as any position, any opening, you develop the pieces, you castle it, and then every opening is different because you have certain ideas that describe the, this or that opening. So, Ethan, when you play s against Sicilian with white, and you get this position, you go for a long castle, what's your general plan? Where are you gonna attack? Which lines are you gonna uh, use right. to attack? Yeah, in this position. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
So you're thinking of defile, right? That's we can identify that we're gonna play in defile. D6 pawn will be um, a weakness, right? Yeah. Because the bishop is on a7, right? And the pawn is on d6. Uh, so the bishop is not on e7 as the mo like more common position, but he's on a7, okay? Do you plan to play in the center, queen side, king side? Where will be most of the game going? You think king side, right? Yes. Okay, so Jim thinks king side. Um, Center first and Center. the king side as a second option. Okay, so let's look at the king side. So it was mentioned that king side will be one of the sides where we're going to play. The rook on g8 is off. Obviously, there is no castle. If we remember the chess rules, once the rook moves, that's it. Uh, so most likely, the black's king option, if he wants to castle, will be long side, right? Maybe knight e5. Then bishop to d7, and then long side castle. So like this, like this. So basically, after identifying that, we eliminate that we're gonna really attack on the king side. The king is not gonna be there, most likely. I don't. Yeah. So if an, <coughs> I don't know how the game continued. It's okay. it, uh, you'll sh you'll show us later. But this is kind of we're trying to analyze. That's what we're doing. So if the king castles long side, then most likely the main attack will be in the center, right? If the king stays in the center, then center and king side. Um, I don't really see that we're going to play on the queen side here. Once you figure that out, so when you play a game, don't forget to ask yourself a question. Once you kind of develop all the pieces, you castle, it, you try to Especially it's good when you don't really know the opening that well. Just try to think logical once all the pieces are developed, you're safe. You know that you didn't blunder anything, you didn't walk into the line that your opponent used against you. Just stop and analyze strategically. Um, and after you create a strategic plan, then there is a tactical part. Where, are you where do I gonna place my pieces? How do I gonna implement my strategic plan? Which pieces will I need for that? So we can basically apply this theory for any position. Um, after knight bd7, so let's continue. Uh, queen, d2. queen d2. So now your king is safe. Knight g4 is not really a big threat. Um, I don't really even think that knight g4 makes any sense, to be quite honest with you. With the idea, knight e5, right? Or knight takes f2. Well, we're going we're gonna to defend it, right, like this. And then if knight plays to e5, what about bishop e2? Opening the d file, attacking the d6. Right. Did you calculate that? Yeah. You did. OK. So you knew that. Queen d2 was a little provocation, right? Yeah. And then, it, and then it was knight c5. OK. King b1. King b1. So you played king b1 here. OK, let me, let me think a little bit. Your idea is that after king b1, they give him a choice, either to take on d3 or to take on b, b3. If he takes b3, take, and then rook moves to c1, right? So that's what you're going to do. OK. What if he takes on d3? What are you going to do then? Queen takes. Did it happen like that in the game? No? And you you threaten the pawn on d6. And basically, there is no defense, because king e7 is bad, d5 not possible, bishop c5 kind of no, uh, awkward. Like, uh, yeah. King e7 looks off to me, really awkward in this position. 
and just maybe we play rook e1 and then f2 is hanging we need to figure that out but after rook e1 probably knight d5 will be stronger but still king f8 after so if we play knight d5 and then pawn takes pawn takes and then king f8 still and meanwhile he can take on f2 with the bishop the bishop on f2 but overall, I think strategically, white is so much better. It's almost like you can just develop your pieces. Again, you can put your rook to e1, then you can play a four, or start with a four, actually, because the bishop on a7 is attacking the f2 square. Just start with a four. That's pretty good. And then after rook e1, you're going to threaten e4, e5. That's another option. Okay, so besides that, let's return back to this position. So when somebody plays knight c5 and offers you to trade the knights, how do you think? Do you calculate first what happens if I take on c5? How do you guys think? Yeah, I always calculate. So first you calculate knight takes on c5, the trade, right? Calculate. So here, if we calculate, because it's a very important decision, important moment, uh, it's a kind of, Every time there is a trade or uh, pawn structure change, it's a very important moment in the game. So you have to stop and think it through. First, let's see what happens if we take on c5. Bishop takes, right? After bishop takes, we can just, I think, again, continue queen f4, because this is really complicated, rook on g8 and king on e8. There is no castle here, so he probably wants to develop um, bishop to d7 and then castle alongside. What if rook e1, say if he castles, do we have e5 here? Kind of take, take h6 yeah i think we can just even take here do you have an extra pawn three six five yeah an extra pawn so the only thing on h2 is hanging do you guys guess see on h2 is knight e4 attacking the bishop And then you have to make a decision where to put the bishop. After this, maybe. Uh, where do you think we should put the bishop? Like b6. I'm thinking f8. Thinking f8? Yeah, d6 is kind of weak, right? Because if we play bishop to b6, then after knight d6 check, well, right now we can't play there. The only thing what I don't like about bishop f8 is that it's a kind of going back to the original square, which I'm not a big fan of that. But again, it may work because rook on g8 threatens g2. So it's, it is a complicated position. You have to sit and calculate everything. Um, but we don't necessarily have to push e5. But it's, it's quite normal, actually. I don't really see anything really bad for black here. Do you, do you see any threats that bothers you? Not really, right? So maybe there is nothing really that bad. I, I've never had any intent to trade, because I like how the research was really weak. OK. So but it's still interesting to calculate and see what's going to happen after you trade, and is it worth it or not? Because um, besides taking on c5, I don't think that knight d4 is that strong. First of all, the knight is not uh, protected, right? Another rule, remember, every time your piece is n unprotected, or you intend to put your piece somewhere where it's not protected, 
just think twice before that because you can <coughs> just miss some, uh, something and it's always I know it's a kind of that's the rule that you teach the beginners like watch out for your pieces so all of them are protected but believe me it's really useful even when you play stronger and stronger because that's very often that where the blunders happen uh, let's see here if the knight takes in d3 queen obviously takes but now black has two bishops advantage and not too bad because bishop d7 and then lonesome castle or we play here the pawn is hanging right well i don't like bishop c5 well maybe bishop d7 we shouldn't play that move i don't understand why you are trying to save this knight like you moved it away so that black can rest oh we're just analyzing so you asked the question why we're trying to save the b3 knight yeah yeah we're just going over the lines because this is an important moment. After this moment, like if like Ethan continued King B1, the pawn structure can change or the trade can occur. After that, everything gonna change. So I wanna analyze all the possible moves. It's a very typical position actually when knight goes to C5 and offers to trade. Uh, you should really eliminate those moves that don't work. And if the bishop wasn't on A7, Knight to d4, it's a very popular move. Here, because the bishop is on a7 after knight d4, it's kind of, it's not protected there, and still you have to watch out there. But if the bishop was on e7, that would have been one of the moves that you would consider. So, anyway, let's move on. So you played king b1. How did he continue? B5. Okay. So he decided not to take, which probably smart. So you from the Fisher games, uh huh. That pawn structure just kills the black's attack. Okay. So you saw that pawn structure before, right? That was something that you analyzed before you uh, analyzed Fisher's games, right? Yeah. If he takes. And then you have this open C file. Yeah, okay. Exactly. There's nothing on it for black to like put pressure on. Okay. So he continued B5. How yeah. uh, F3. F3. Why did you play F3 and not F4? Well, F, well I'm going to play F3, G4. F3, G4, and then you wanted to play H4. Okay. Here, here's the reason why I think this plan again because sicilian is so complicated there are so many plans that you can confuse them there are different positions so f3 g4 h4 can be awesome when there is a pawn on g6 and when the king is castled here it's perfect because once you have black pawn on g6 then your pawn on g4 your pawn on h4 and then you push to h5 works really well Right now, imagine your pawns on g4 and h4. I don't know what we're going to attack. Yes. That would be uh, my objective here because. I would like to h5, h6, and then attack g7. Attack g7. Well, it all depends. But he can. Well, h6, he probably can't play because if he plays h6, then you take on f6. And then the pawn will be hanging. So the pawn on h6. But. Um, it's too slow, that's what I can say. Sicilian is a very dynamic opening. You can't just sit in one spot and, well, maybe only in the closed Sicilian, but even in the closed Sicilian, there is that attack on the king side where you have to be very careful. So we can't even say that closed Sicilian. It's very sharp opening most of the time, it's very dynamic. So playing slow, it's not very typical for Sicilian, all I can say. Um, I would con consider playing f4 here instead of f3. That would be me. Uh, but let's see, f3, maybe that worked well for you. Then again, typical attack f3, g4, h4 is when the pawn is on g6. For those of you who play uh, Accelerated Dragon, you probably know that. Too well, <laughs> Too well right? 
All right. Uh, how did black continue? Bishop b7. Bishop uh, b7, right? Yeah. Okay, so he played b5, then he plays bishop b7. And then I played uh, bishop takes f6. Okay, so bishop takes f6 here. He yeah, takes. Why did you decide to take right here? Well, Oh, so that was a combination. <laughs> Could we just play that combination before? Yeah, before I, F3? I, 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 no. Uh, the pawn takes okay, let's see. Take. Take. Check. Okay. Takes. Knight takes B5. Again, it's another typical combination. This is silly, and it's cool that you saw it. Um, so. Let me think where is the best position for the queen here. Queen b6, probably. Check. And then king e7. I don't really see how to advance it. Do you guys see? Any ideas for white? Knight takes c5, <coughs> queen takes c5, okay. Uh, wait, 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 knight takes bishop first. First knight takes bishop, okay. Yeah. <coughs> rook takes. All of a sudden this rook is not that bad, <laughs> attacking the g2 pawn. Okay. I uh, think it doesn't work here. The compensation, oh, but you're, yeah, you're yeah, calculating queen d7, okay. Check, but what if I go here? There's no checkmate. Okay. But that's interesting. All those sharp lines, like sacrifice on b5, that's. No, it's, r it's really good after f3. After f3, f3. okay. Bishop, bishop, so maybe that and was just a, another provocation, it's right? It's a lot better here because after bishop b7. Why did you decide that you have to take the knight because first? I, because I thought. Uh, well, because you were thinking about that combination. If, if we just look at this line without the combination, I wouldn't really take on f6, wouldn't rush with that. Uh, but let's see how it worked for you with the combination. Okay, bishop takes f6. Uh-huh. Uh, Did you take on b5? Uh, I took on b5 with bishop. Okay. Takes. Uh, knight takes b5. Okay. And takes b5. So queen c6. Queen c6. So here, do you think he calculated that if he uh, place queen b6, then you're gonna continue, gonna take, and then you're gonna take on c5. Yeah. I think you saw that. Yeah, the Did you see that when you were? Yeah, it was a 40, we only had 45 minute uh, time control. 45 minutes time control, so how much time did you have here? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh, 45 minutes you had for the game, now you had 15 minutes. So you spent about 30 minutes for the opening, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, usually when you play 45 minutes, and again, depends on the opening. Sicilian, if you don't know the lines, you're obviously probably going to spend a lot of time. But it's a little bit too much, 30 minutes for the opening, because you have to leave yourself some time to finish the game. Yeah, with, but with around three to four pawns, it's just somewhat straightforward. Yeah, if you happen to calculate some line like this and you know it's winning, it's probably gonna benefit you and 15 minutes will be enough. But if it's just a normal play, how many minutes did he have? Well, after he had to make through his whole combination. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah. how much time did he have? 10. 10, so you had 15, he had 10. Well, again, it depends how much time your opponent has. If you have more time than your opponent, then probably that situation is fine too. So, how do you guys usually play? Do you play fast? Jim, what about you? Slower. So are you like Ethan? You spend more time in the beginning? Not so much in the beginning, but in the middle of that game. Not so much. Okay. Time. And then do you feel like you were um, you don't have enough time to finish the game sometimes or just I do. I do feel time pressure toward the end of the game. Okay. Well one of the good advices about that is just choose the most logical move. 
especially when you don't have enough time, just don't calculate 10 times the same variation. This is what we all tend to do. We tend to choose a couple lines and then go back and forth to that line, right? And kind of hesitate, should I go there? If you don't see that you're winning the material or you're checkmating in that line, then don't waste your time, especially if you're sacrificing something. Choose the most logical one. If you haven't found anything in 10 minutes thinking, most likely nothing's gonna happen in the next five minutes. You're just gonna go calculate over and over those variations. That's just from my experience. Obviously, when the super strong grandmasters play, it probably is different. We have to ask them how they think. But uh, for most people, if you spent enough time to calculate those lines and didn't find anything, just don't waste your time. Just choose the most logical one. Um, so here, let's see, Ethan, how you continued. I'm curious, um, how did you how did you win three pawns? King e7? Uh, I won more than three pawns as well. <coughs> king e7. King e7. So when you played king e7, did you see that move before where you were hoping for king f8? No, I saw that move. Good. I had an idea for it. Because at least in this position, you should see two moves, king e7 and king f8. Well, obviously, king can go to d file. Yeah. I played knight a5. Knight a5. How did he respond? Uh, he played queen b6. Queen b6 he played. OK. And then I just played knight. Uh, knight d takes b7. Took, queen and then b7. queen d7. Any other options here? Let's think. There's queen c7, which and it's knight takes b7, knight takes c7, uh, d7, sorry. Takes, Next. takes, then knight c5. Then knight c5 here. How are you going to win this position? Did you see that? Yeah. I saw it straightforward. So you were going for this position, right? Yeah. I was either going to draw this. How are you going to draw this? Well, uh, there, was, there was not a high chance of loss here. Well, but look at the, look at the rooks. I'm going to bring the rook to b8, and now your king will be under attack. Or, I mean, on g, this rook is actually fine. Now you're going to play rook a to b8, and then another rook from g8 gonna just okay this rook comes here this rook comes here that's another reason why bishop x f6 is not the first continuation okay well here actually i don't really like this bishop f6 anymore you know yes. you know why imagine the bishop on g5 guys and then your pawn from e4 will be able to attack and be pushed to e5 and there will be a pin i don't like this i like how it happened in your game that you trapped him and he didn't find the right move. I don't like taking an f6. We need to calculate that without taking an f6. Maybe that makes better sense. Well, actually, I have the line on my computer. Which did you? Did you analyze that on your computer? Yeah, it's just bishop x 5 and the computer gives it like plus 5. So instead of bishop takes f6, you should have played bishop right. takes b5. Th that line that we analyzed right away, right? Right, right here. OK, let's see what your computer told. Uh, uh huh. Queen c6. Queen c6. Knight x d6. Okay. King e7. Knight f8. King e7. Uh, king f8, sorry. Knight a5. Queen d6. Okay, uh, king f8. Knight to a5. Uh, queen b6. Queen b6. And knight a c4. a c4. And you definitely have enough compensation. Then maybe even take here. Okay, queen moves here. That's a good position to play, I'm just play let's say, against a friend, right? Because you know, guys, the most complicated part is winning the winning position, right? How many times we get the winning position? And then we're like, yay, we're so much better. When it comes to the uh, winning part, we make mistakes. Because usually, when we prepare for the game, when we train, we never uh, play the positions where we're just winning, right? We think, oh, we're just much better, or I'm a pawn up, I'm fine here. So that's why it's very useful to play certain positions, even when you know you're kind of winning. 
play against your friend and try to win it. What if I play here? Just play there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I play here, oh, what would you do? Yeah, Does it make sense to go back? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe just C4. C4 here. Beautiful rook on G8, right? Isn't it? <laughs> From the opening. <laughs> Yeah, it's a kind of like get, getting awkward here. Knight e7 is bad. Knight c7. Here, knight f7? Yeah. And for a person, um, well, rook d6 here, the knight is hanging. You play right here or later? You mean after rook d6? No, before. Right here. And then rook d6. Yeah. Okay. And then there is, uh, there is a trap. For a person who likes tactics, just wonderful setup. Anytime uh, the player who likes sharp games can sacrifice in b5, they're just so happy. I don't really even think that they calculate till the last move. They just feel that. <laughs> so, Ethan, are you more tactical player or tactical. more You like I, tactical I, I, positions, I got right? I like to go for it. So okay. Like, okay. So you, you just, go just took the risk bec because you felt that yeah, I had a sacrifice on B5 I can, can benefit. I think that's if you manage to play like Rook D6, right? There's, the, there's nothing to stop it. Really. But you should keep in mind, actually, that was a le very legit question. Why did we sacrifice an F7? Because we're sacrificing another piece. Not, we already sacrificed one. And then we're two pieces down. And you should understand one, once you sacrifice, your opponent can start sacrificing back in order to save his position. So that, that's a quite legit question. Can we avoid taking an F7? Maybe we can just bring the queen yeah, there and attack uh, the F7 pawn? Either. I don't I don't see either. So queen of four instead of taking of seven, I think, much stronger. Thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah it's it's actually uh, after ni after queen of four, you guys should consider knight takes b seven. Knight takes b seven and then rook d seven as well. Yeah, it's one of the options. But really, bishop on g five shouldn't take on f six. Besides knight d5, what else can he do? Knight d7. And then no, you play queen f4 yeah, again. No, no, wait. Now here I think knight xf7 works. Because you have the square for knight d6. Again. How are you going to protect? Um, so if he plays knight d7, you play knight f4, how is he going to defend the f7 square? What's he going to do? I just don't see anything. Again, we just come to the same situation. Once you get the knight on d6, uh, queen of four, it's a typical combination how it works. Watch. It's um, also one of the French defense ideas, uh, knight on d6 and queen of four uh, with white. When I was, when I was a little kid, there were some lines I remembered that they were like this. Right here? Were you a French player? No, I was never yeah. a French defense player, but I played with white uh, against <coughs> French defense. And then I remember when I was a little girl just playing, um, I don't know, maybe I was seven, eight years old. So I had some lines like this, like the knight comes to d6, then you bring the queen to f4. So this is the structure. So. Um, Returning back here. So queen c6 is the only move, right? Yeah. According to the computer and according to our analysis, probably queen c6 is the only move. Then you take on d6, king e7. Uh, for king e7, knight e5? You played knight e5. Okay. The computer said queen d6 is most logical. 
Queen B6. You had the same position, well, but without the bishop on G5, yeah. right? Bishop takes, and then the pawn was I guess it takes on F6. C7. Even here, e5. That's the beauty of having the bishop on g5. This e5 thread is really, I really. That after, I, after I played bishop x6, I realized the tactic works, and it's a lot better here. Okay. Well, that was a very nice game. And I think that. So you didn't know the sacrifice before. Did you analyze that? No. So you came up uh, with that decision at the board, right? Yeah. While playing the game. Yeah. Well, that's great. That because usually if you don't play this variation and you don't see it, you don't analyze, many players don't take on b5 because they kind of didn't prepare that. But that's pretty, pretty cool that you decided to go for that line. Does anybody have questions about this game? So yeah. Ethan, thank you very much for sharing your game. Thank you. And that bishop b5 was really awesome. Since you never saw that, it's, it's really great. You found it. Yeah, so. never saw was it and congratulations on beating uh, the higher rating opponent. It feels really good once you beat somebody higher rated, right? Yeah.